Good evening. Given that it is the spookiest time of year, I thought we'd dive into the rich tradition of the creature feature, specifically the impact they had on television. To clarify, creature feature was the generic name for a horror movie, especially one featuring a monster and a certain level of campiness, whether intentional or not. Many films produced in the 1930s and 40s found a second life in TV syndication, presented by hosts usually assuming some sort of ghoulish character. In this video, we'll be looking at some of these films and personalities, their history, as well as the lasting legacy of the midnight movie. From the very beginning, television has relied on certain programming anchors, be it situational comedies, police dramas, sports, most of which had already established themselves as radio staples. Horror was no exception. The genre of horror lends itself perfectly to radio because imagination. Everything is scarier through the lens of our own experience, and audio entertainment, like literature, exploits this by giving just enough details, letting us fill in the rest. A great example of this was Orson Welles' reading of The War of the Worlds. Wells created and hosted the Mercury Theater on the Air, a weekly drama series that frequently adapted classic literature into radio plays. For Halloween 1938, they chose to adapt H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. Rather than simply perform the story, Wells framed it as if the broadcast had been interrupted by reports of an alien invasion. Radio listeners were not ready to have the fourth wall broken on them like that, and the broadcast caused widespread panic. One of the most popular horror programs of the radio era was CBS's Suspense. Running from 1940 to 1962, Suspense presented thrilling stories, often concerning people's relationship with then-modern technologies, like the automobile or the telephone. These were plays, conveyed by actors, but a host plugged the sponsor and set up the program, introducing listeners to the cast and setting. In 1949, Suspense made the leap to television, along with much of the public's interests. Before we jump into television, though, I want to take a quick detour into the pages of EC Comics. EC was known for their horror comics, and every issue featured several suspenseful stories tied together by a host. Now, The Crypt Keeper is probably the most famous of these. He narrated Tales from the Crypt, but EC actually had two other hosts depending on the series, with The Vault Keeper holding down The Vault of Horror, and The Witch hosting the less popular The Haunt of Fear. In terms of television, though, everything starts with Vampyra. Actress Mela Nermi won a Hollywood costume contest with a look inspired by Morticia from Charles Adams Comics, published in The New Yorker and later adapted into The Adams Family. Shortly after, she was approached by producer Hunt Stromberg Jr. to host horror movies on LA's local ABC station. The result was The Vampire Show. Initially, airing at midnight, the time when most channels signed off, the show and Vampire became extremely popular. Unfortunately, in that time, television was broadcast live and not many kinescopes were made of Vampire's show. The show would only last a year, as Nermi refused to sell the station the rights to the character. However, despite this, and only airing in Los Angeles, media coverage allowed Vampire to grow into a pop culture icon, a position she leveraged, appearing on talk shows and making cameos in sitcoms and films, most notably in Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space. In 1957, Screen Gems licensed the syndication rights to the horror films produced by Universal Studios in the 30s and 40s. For more on them, you can check out our recent Monsters of Propaganda video, but to summarize, these are adaptations of classic horror icons from literature and folklore. For many, these are the definitive film versions of characters such as Dracula or Frankenstein's monster. Packaged and released as shock theater, these aired mostly on weekends, either in the afternoon or late at night, and were geared towards a younger audience. Given their relatively short run times, anywhere between 58 and 99 minutes, networks need a padding to fill a two-hour block. Enter a host. Shock Theater would air all over America, either under that name or Creature Features, or other generic names with a different host depending on the region. These hosts were sometimes plucked from the staff already working at the stations, and would fill the needed airtime with monologues and trivia about the film, as well as skits. Now I'm not going to break down every host in every region, but there are a few I want to give some time to, starting with Zachary. John Zachary began his career at WCAU in Philadelphia, where he worked as a supporting actor in a local western. In 1957, he became Philly's host of Shock Theater, with a common gimmick of a ghoul. His bits included talking to his coffin-bound wife, as well as his assistant who was storing up in a sack. A year later, he moved this act to New York, retitling the show Zachary at Large. Zachary embraced the emerging genre of rock music and would occasionally feature popular musical acts and dance parties similar to American Bandstand. In Cleveland, Shock Theater was hosted by the hip Goulardi. Goulardi, portrayed by Ernie Anderson, was modeled after the Beatniks, and like Zachary, he incorporated music into his routine, leaning more towards experimental rock and jazz. Like Vampyra, and a lot of other early horror hosts, not that much footage exists of Goulardi. I've read he frequently disparaged local celebrities and politicians, doing so, attracting his fair share of controversy. He would also frequently clash with his producers. Anderson would retire the character in 1966 and return to it only once, appearing on Joe Bob's Drive-In Theater in 1991. The character Svengoolie first appeared on Chicago television in Screaming Yellow Theater and was played by Jerry G. Bishop. 
This ran from 1970 to 1973. In 1979, the character would be resurrected by a rich Kaz with Sana Sanguli. Under Kaz, Sanguli would become one of the longest running whore hosts in history. His gimmick involved singing song parodies of the films he was showcasing and conducting a running commentary, poking fun at them which inspired something coming up. With the emergence of cable television, broadcast rights for these classic horror films became increasingly expensive. Still, the whore host marched on, airing cheaper, low-budget films like those produced by Roger Corman, as well as localized kaiju. Now we've seen the relationship between horror and music, specifically rock music, and by the 1980s, with nostalgia for these films and even the hosts, bands were formed under their influence. Like The Misfits, The Cramps, kids who grew up on horror and television who worked the aesthetics into their own brand. The 1980s would also give us perhaps the most famous horror host at Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. After Sinister Seymour, host of LA's Friday Night passed away, he was briefly replaced by Mona Lisa and Grimsley before the show went on hiatus. In 1980, producers attempted to bring the show back with input from the appearer herself, Mela Nermi, but Nermi quit the project when they refused to hire her choice of actors, Lola Falana. Putting out a casting call, they found Cassandra Peterson, who was allowed to develop a character herself. Thus, Elvira was born. Donning a revealing black dress and wig, she would host Elvira's movie Macabre. The films were a couple o even though shown by other hosts, intentionally, as much as the show's humor revolved around her ridiculing the movie with ample jokes about her sex appeal thrown in for good measure. However, she bore a striking resemblance to Vampira, who delivered a cease and desist claiming copyright infringement. While admitting there were similarities between the character's appearance and even catchphrases, the court ruled in favor of Peterson, as Elvira's personality differed from Vampira. Similarly though, she became a pop culture icon, making many appearances on The Tonight Show and was embraced by MTV at the peak of their popularity. She even got her own movie, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, in 1988. The last host, or hosts, we're going to be looking at are the cast of Mystery Science Theater 3000. The show has undergone many changes throughout the years, but the basic premise remains the same. A human is forced into space and sentenced to watch B-movies. He is joined by three robots, Crow, Tom Servo, and Gypsy, oof, who help him in providing running commentary. Unique to MST3K is the fact that the hosts appear in silhouette, and while some of the films they watch can be classified as horror, they also critique educational and industrial films. It began in 1988 on local television in Minneapolis before being picked up by Comedy Central, where it aired until 1996. It then ran on the Sci-Fi Channel for three seasons and was revived on Netflix in 2017. This shows that while the idea of a whore host is rooted in regional television, their legacy lives on. Today, there are entire cable channels and even a streaming service dedicated to horror, and critics, commentators, and enthusiasts like myself are plentiful here on YouTube for better or worse. With the nature of airing regionally during the television era, it's no wonder that these hosts have become local institutions, becoming part of the shared consciousness of the communities they cater to. Many had extensive careers, some, like Svengoolie, continue to this day. Now before anyone says, well, what about Rod Serling or Alfred Hitchcock, I wanted to focus on the format of hosts presenting classic horror films. And if you want to see more, I will post links to relevant material in the description below. If you have a favorite or a local horror host, let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and uh, share it. I cannot stress how much that helps. We are entirely viewer supported as well. I do not believe in running ads, so if you want to support the channel and keep it going, you can do so at patreon.com slash pixandportraits and get a ton of exclusive content in return. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and happy Halloween!